So uh, let me just pray for us uh, before we start. Lord, uh, we thank you for this great opportunity to be here together uh, to learn about M6, to learn about some of the solutions uh, you let creative people come up with for so much of the suffering in this world, um, for the blind and the poor. And we pray that we can be your hands and feet uh, in sharing your love uh, with those who um, are suffering in many places in the world. Lord, we've talked about a lot of things tonight, uh, today, all day long. I pray you'll just give me the words you want me to share tonight uh, with these folks. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so this is ominously titled The Ten Commandments of Missions. The first thing I want to say is this isn't a list of things to do and not do. All right, the Ten Commandments is this is about our hearts, and God wants to transform our hearts. Um, and then all the rest will just happen by itself. Uh, but God's looking to capture our hearts. Uh, my qualifications to be up here with you and talk about this. Um, I'm actually a missionary kid. So, so when I was two, we left the United States. And uh, I probably spent about half my life in Africa. And uh, I've also been a short-termer. And now I've been a long-termer. Um, so lots of different perspectives. Being a kid, watching visitors come. You know, being a short-termer, being the visitor. And now being a long-termer hosting others. Uh, so these are just some of the things I've gleaned. I've also talked, kind of preparing with this with uh, lots of other missionaries just to kind of get their thoughts in. They all pretty much have the same things to say. So here we go. Uh, quick intro. All right, that's interesting. I'm not sure if there's a video buried in there. Nope. All right, just another click. Um, so I live in Burundi. Burundi is one of the least known places on earth probably. It's a little tiny country in Central Africa sandwiched between Congo and Tanzania. And I work with Hope Africa University. Burundi is a country that's been plagued by ethnic conflict. Uh, it's Hutu and Tutsi, same issues in Rwanda. They had a war from 93 that sparked really in a lot of ways the Rwandan genocide. Burundi's war went on for 14 years, but you only heard about Rwanda. That war lasted a year. Um, it spilled over into Congo and that lasted a lot longer, but um, Burundi is a, a, a broken place, but during that 14-year war, refugees in Kenya, who are French-speaking, decided to start a university because they never knew if they were going to get back home or not, and their kids needed a francophone system, so they started Hope Africa University in Nairobi. Kenya's bureaucracy became overwhelming, and uh, they decided to transplant it back to Burundi as the war was kind of simmering down. And so this Christian university became kind of the first private university post-war. And it went from 100 students in 2003. And when we you know, got there, it had over 6,000 students. So it was the largest private university in the country. Um, our goal here is to help that university. The president in 2006 asked them to start a medical school post-war. Most of the doctors had left or other things had happened to them. and so. The president asked them to start a medical school. They had no doctors, but they said, sure, why not? <laughs> and um, so in 2006, they started a medical school. Long story short, we visited in 2010, went to see their main teaching hospital, and there was not a full-time physician present at the hospital. They had four doctors on staff all down in the capital, and they would occasionally go up to the teaching hospital up in the mountains. But, um, of the four doctors, only one had kind of like a partial residency. The other three were from the Congo, and it had never done a residency there, you know, straight out of medical school. So we thought we could probably be of some assistance uh, in helping getting things off the ground. So basically, we were, um, I'm at Kabuye Hope Hospital, which in 2010 was kind of a post-war hospital with no running, very little running water. It usually didn't run, uh, and uh, very few patients at the time. And so that's where we're at. But the more interesting part of the story is how we got there. So today our team has 50 plus people on it. Um, I'm a missionary kid, like I told you, and I saw kind of the dysfunction of a mission station growing up, and I thought, and it would be really fun to like go to the mission field with a group of really amazing people. And um, 
So God just kind of put it on my heart to be kind of along my training, be looking for interesting people. And uh, during medical school, I ran into another missionary kid, and we started joking around about going to Africa together. Uh, we happened to go to the same church, and someone in the class below me, who wasn't totally into missions, married someone from California who was definitely into missions, and man, he really got on board. And anyway, so a team of us, of three families, we all um, went into this together. We all went to the same church in Ann Arbor. And uh, so we were all kind of, at the time, headed in different directions, but God just said, yeah, put on the brakes um, and create a team vision. So we kind of decided, you know, Jason Fader was headed to Sudan to a war zone. We were kind of headed in a different direction. And I said, let's do a two-year short-term thing together and really try to define if we we're a good team and what our vision would be if we did this. Um, and so we went to Tenwick, which was the last place on earth I wanted to go. As a missionary kid, there's more missionaries per capita in Kenya than any place on the planet. And I was like, God, why? Why Kenya? Um, but that's where he sent us. And he did that because Tenwick has been there for almost 100 years. And when it was started, they weren't thinking about training. But over you know, almost a century, they become a major teaching hospital. And so what our team really got a passion for while we were there is the power of education and training. And we said, we want to train African physicians. And we want to do that in a place where there isn't a whole lot of that going on. So you can't do that in an open conflict. You can't run a medical school when there's active war going on. So we were kind of looking for like a post-war kind of place. And Francophone. Anglophone Africa is usually quite a bit ahead of Francophone Africa. The French and the Belgians were a little bit different, uh, had a little bit different style of colonization, and uh, they didn't put in a lot of infrastructure behind them. Um, so anyways, uh, we were looking at Chad, Madagascar, and Burundi, uh, and we ended up in Burundi, obviously. A lot more to the story, but God put our team there. We landed there in 2013 with 16 people. And now a few, later, a few years later, we have over 50 people on our team. So our team's exploded, which comes with all sorts of issues in itself. But um, God's really blessing the work there. I could go on and on, but it's been a long day, so I won't. This is just a little video, I believe, that's going to give you a, a one and a half minute overview of what we're doing at Kabuye. In the mountainous rural farmlands of the poorest, hungriest nation on earth, there stands a hospital, founded before the first genocide, before independence, before the last world war on a single premise, hope. We're not the best people for this job. Our students are. They hear, speak, sense, and feel what we cannot and will not. Kabuye isn't huge right now and it's quite remote. Not much besides thousands and thousands of needy people. But in an unprecedented move, Hope Africa University, a premier Christian African university, named this place as their primary teaching site for their medical and nursing schools. So we're planning, designing, and building the facilities that will teach and heal Africans for generations to come. The students come from everywhere, and for many of them raised in the cities, this place is quite a shock. It's unexpected, but we want to help them grapple with the needs of their own country. It's about caring and teaching at the same time. It's about doing it and modeling it. Facing African realities, even as they're gaining the tools needed to deal with those realities. Nothing is more sustainable than education. Knowledge and ideas, faith, hope, love. These are the only resources that grow the more we share them. It's more than just bringing specialists from around the world here to teach and heal in rural Burundi. We are only interested in this work so far as we can raise up a generation of societal leaders and community servants. From Africa, for Africa. Hopefully no one had a seizure, a little bit fast paced, but that's the general idea. So, Burundi is a beautiful, beautiful country full of mountains. It's um, also incredibly broken. Uh, Rwanda and Burundi are the two most populated, densely populated countries in Africa. So the land can sustain about three and a half million people, but there's 12 million people trying to eke out into existence on mountainsides uh, where there's not enough land to, to feed the people. So it's the hungriest, least developed nation on earth. 60% of kids are malnourished. I thought this picture captured the beauty and the brokenness of doing ophthalmology in Central Africa. So this is uh, Dr. Adrian, who I was training to do M6. And we've got this beautiful Zeiss ceiling-mounted microscope. Um, but 
our ceiling has a hole in it. It started raining, and you know it's dripping on him and the patient's head. So our our uh, helper there is protecting our surgeon from the rain, and she also has a handy fly swatter. So I was like, I got to get a picture of that. <laughs> so beautiful things happening there. He's doing independent M6 surgery while being uh, having an umbrella held over him with a fly swatter. But this is the team I get to work with day in and day out, and they're super, super special, really talented group of people that are um, very devoted uh, to caring for their, their fellow countrymen. And interestingly, two of my staff were born in the very room we, we run our clinic out of back in the day in the 80s. So anyways, let's get to the, get to the actual talk now. <laughs> it's been a long day. But, um, so the Ten Commandments of Missions. Number one, I think the first thing we have to do is surrender our own kingdom. And what do I mean by that? Well, as Americans, we've got, we've got a kingdom. I mean, we're in Texas, for crying out loud. You come on my property without permission, I'll darn well shoot you. So don't enter. This property is secured by Smith and Weston. The dog will bite you. So we've, we, you know, in our suburban neighborhoods, we've walled ourselves in. We've cocooned ourselves in in our little kingdoms. And inside that fortress, you know, you've got your lazy boy, and you know, God pity the man who comes between you and your television. You know, be it your kid having a problem or just whatever interruption in life. We've definitely, in America, we've got kind of these private kingdoms. Uh, and we can actually take that little chair and put it into a little mobile kingdom. If someone cuts us off, look out. The full fury is coming at you uh, for messing with my little kingdom. And we can take that to our practice uh, where we can, can be a tyrant. <laughs> Anyways, anything that becomes between our goals, our desires, and our passions you know, can really get us uh, um, upset and uh, fired up. And there's all sorts of things bound into that. Our identity, um, you know, kind of what we think success looks like, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So anyways, um, it can be making idols out of things. You know, my kids, you know, I can make an idol out of my, my kids and their success and kind of living, living through their success. They can also drive me crazy when they get in the way of my own desires and, and goals. So, you know, I've got all sorts of ways this plays out in life, but we've all got it, guarantee you. As a missionary, I've got all sorts of great plans for God and what I want to accomplish uh, in Africa. I want to bring eye care to Central Africa. And I'll tell you what, there's a whole lot of things not letting me do that, and it can make me so flaming angry. Um, and it's because it's my kingdom, uh, and I have to surrender that over and over and over. Um, to God. Um, so really, we want to be running fiefdoms. You know, like in the old feudal system, there's the, the king, and he had his vassals. And, his, and, and we want to be taking the things God's given us and using them for, for him. So, um, and he's given us a lot. The average ophthalmologist in this room has the capacity to generate a thousand times what a Burundian brings in a year. So... For most of the world, um, we are super, super wealthy. As a missionary, I'm like an NBA millionaire walking around in Burundi, but I'd be considered living under the poverty line in America. But I'm in the top eighth percentile of people in the world. I'm filthy rich um, as a missionary. And so you are, as, basically by being in, Amer in America, you're in a, the upper stratosphere of wealth. And God's given you that for a reason. Um, he didn't do it, it wasn't an accident, uh, and he wants you to use it. So getting back to the first commandment, um, when someone asked Jesus, what's the most important thing I need to do? He quoted uh, the Pentateuch, uh, and he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Lord, that means the king, the sovereign, right? There's not two sovereigns. He's it. And you better surrender your kingdom to his um, if uh, you want to get on board. And then he went on to continue quoting that passage. 
um, that we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, mind, and strength. So we can't be hanging on to these idols that we've got, and we've got a whole lot of them. I've got a ton of them, and you just got to keep, keep uh, taking them down and letting God capture our hearts. I mean, there's so many distractions. Uh, Jonathan Edwards talked about um, the loves that capture our hearts, and he talked about having properly ordered loves, and God's got to be at the top of that pile. There's lots of great things in this life. I love M6, but if that takes precedence over where God needs to belong in my life, that becomes an idol. So we've got issues of control, especially as op- ophthalmic surgeons. We have lots of control issues guaranteed. You know, we've got all our identity wrapped up in our profession and our success. We've got dreams, expectations, desires. We've got our comfort. Um, we've got to hand those all over to, to God to do what he, he wants with that. So it just comes down to God's looking for a relationship with us um, is the bottom line, and we've got to hand all those things over to him and pursue him with everything we've got. So that's kind of the, that's the setup. That's where our heart's got to be as we go into missions. Man, you can have so many idols in missions. Going on one of these trips, you know, you can come back, man, your status and your community. Oh, yeah, that's the doctor who goes, you know, to the middle of nowhere and helps blind people see. And uh, there can be all sorts, of, all sorts of stuff wrapped up in being uh, a missionary and, and doing these trips. And God wants to uh, take our hearts to a different place. The rest of the talk really comes out to how do we love our neighbor, which was the second command Jesus told, told this guy. How does that play out for us? And these are just a, a few of the, in, you know, there's an infinite way this can, can happen. But I'd say the first thing is pride. In Proverbs, it said God detests. There's a list of things. But number one is pride, and that was the original sin. And, man, we're good at that. Um, I'm so proud. Um, another way to put it is, don't be a jerk. All right? So I didn't realize this, but when God handed down the Ten Commandments to Moses, there was a third tablet that he couldn't get down the mountain, and it was, don't be a jerk. And sometimes, you know, you can say, I'm sorry, I can't hear you over the sound of how awesome I am. I can do a five-minute M6 with these hands. Did I tell you about the time I did 500 cataracts? You know, we, we're so full of ourselves, and uh, uh, God, God really, really doesn't like that. So for me, um, I, I, in, in undergrad, I went to talk to a former missionary surgeon who is a professor where I was studying. He's an anatomy professor, and I said, you yeah, know, I'm interested in being a medical missionary. I said, what is the number one thing I should learn while I'm preparing? And uh, he said, oh, that's easy. He says humility. Um, he said, when you, when you get over there, you're going to be the most highly educated person. You're going to have a God complex. Um, and uh, he said, the most important thing God could teach you is humility. So I prayed for that. And that was maybe a major mistake. <laughs> um, long story short, I've shared this actually at COS. Man, what year was that, Stan? 2008, 2009? Um, you can look at it online. But I told the story of how God took me through a brutal depression uh, during my internship to the point where you know, I was suicidal. Um, and to keep going through my internship, literally my dad came out to Pennsylvania and took me to work every day and took me home every day so I wouldn't have to be admitted to a psych ward. Um, and my program director rearranged things, so obviously I didn't have serious patient responsibilities during that time. But um, that was a super humbling experience. Um, and amazingly, I'm still proud. <laughs> but God just showed me how fragile we are. We are not as strong as we think we are. Um, overnight, we can, there's a story of Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king of Babylon. He had everything, you know, the, the biggest kingdom in the world at the time. And God humbled him, and he was on all four eating grass in a field for seven years. Um, so I think it was seven years. Was it seven years? Um, so, you know, we, we are not big stuff. And um, it's good if we can recognize that most days and have that attitude that uh, every, every day we have is a gift from God, and he has a purpose um, for us. So, so I said, you know, I haven't gotten rid of that pride. As we go in as Westerners, 
with our fancy M6 and our fancy microscopes and we think we know how to do everything, we can really offend our national partners. And so just to show you that I haven't gotten rid of my pride, this is basically what my national partner had to say to me in a very indirect African way, but what it came down to is, you think you're better than us, you use your money to get whatever you want and manipulate the situation to get, get your way, and you don't bother to really understand our perspective and our culture. Um, and uh, obviously, that was a major blow that the person I'm working alongside had that opinion of me. But it shows you that you know, my pride is really well ingrained. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something we have to keep coming back to. And so that required me to really look at how were those things true and uh, repent and ask forgiveness. But um, God's looking for that, that broken, uh, humble heart. So number three, you know, this, a lot of these trips are going to be geared to production, right? Oh, how many cataracts did we do? But if you, if you get all tangled up in, you know, productivity and how much you do and basing your identity on what you do, um, you're in trouble. One, you might be successful and you're going to become really proud. Two, you might fail and you're, you're going to be a mess because your identity is wrapped up in the wrong things. So when we go on these trips, I would say really put relationships above productivity. You know, that, that, that sounds easy, but it may actually mean you don't get to all the patients sometimes. Um, so there's hard choices you're going to have to make. Uh, but I would say in most cultures in the world, you're not going to get far if you put getting stuff done above having a relationship with people. Um, so that would be way up there on my list of, of things to focus on. And again, we've talked about it over and over today. If you can build a long-term relationship as an ophthalmologist with someone in a, in a place that is in dire need, you can be a tremendous support from a distance to helping make them be an effective eye care provider. Um, so again, that idea of relationship and not thinking about how many cataracts can I do when I go there for a week. That's, that's nothing that in the scheme of things. But your relationship with someone in country could be the start of an amazing movement for eye care in that country. So you, you show up, maybe you're going to you know, a mission hospital like ours, and uh, you get there and you're like, oh, look how these missionaries are living. Oh, why, why do things run so poorly? I mean, you can just start. There's a lot of things to judge. There is so much brokenness. Um, you can become the judge immediately uh, and start just pointing out all the problems and the faults of the system and the people. Um, and that's not going to go well for you. Um, so I'd say one of the most important things you can do relationally, which I think is way up there on the list of important things, is to choose in your heart to withhold judgment. And I don't mean just to choose to not say things, because everyone knows when someone's judging them and they don't have to say anything, right? But you gotta choose in your heart to withhold judgment. Um, and this is hard, uh, hard for me even. As a long-termer, I have to keep doing this with my national partners too. Um, I can become really cynical and really jaded because uh, the longer there, the more dirt, you know, and, and things. Uh, so there's this amazing paradox, and we're all a paradox of these things that just baffle your mind. And then these amazing demonstrations of faith, and you're like, how can these two things coexist? And I know they're looking at my life and saying the same thing. <laughs> um, so the beautiful thing, God has set us free from having to judge. Uh, so I say that's a... Um, Really important thing. We've talked about this over and over. Um, you want to go into this as a learner. Uh, no matter how good you are, there's so many things you can learn. Um, but everyone's got, got something that they can teach you. And so go in as a learner. That being said, I think you, you also want to leave something behind. But uh, if you can go in as a learner, as a priority, and to learn from people, and, uh, and not be the, the Westerner coming in to show them how everything's done, 
that can go a long ways to a healthy relationship. And of course, you're going to have to be flexible. I doubt anyone here has gone on a trip and things have gone how they planned. Um, and so, you know, maybe you end up at this eye clinic and you're doing circumcisions. I don't know. I saw this one in Kenya. <laughs> and the bus stops there. It's very convenient. It'll take you right to the clinic, get your circumcision, have your M6, and you're good to go. So just to shake things up, I'll tell a story here about two ophthalmologists. I, like Wendy, I haven't had very many visitors. I don't know why. <laughs> but um, there's a Quebecois ophthalmologist who is at CUS, Andrew Torin, who came to visit me. I'm not sure even how he found out about me. Someone in Texas, actually, who told, told him about me. And then uh, he had a friend who was an Austrian. And so the two of them came. He was a resident in Austria. And um, we had done uh, you know, a couple weeks together. And we were like, yeah, this weekend, let's go on a little exploration. Um, and so I'd heard about this amazing waterfall that was really hard to get to. And these guys were both you know, single guys looking for some adventure. So I said, you want to go try to find this waterfall? And there's like hot springs supposedly there. And uh, just amazing place. So six hours later, we finally found the place. Um, and we had a group with us. But there are many, many very sketchy bridges where I made everyone get out of the vehicle just in case I didn't make it over. Um, but uh, we finally got there. Here we are getting there. It was a beautiful day. And uh, we had to hike back into this uh, gorge. And down below, there's a big ravine. Um, and so little did you know, these guys know. This is Andrew. He's huge. He's a big guy. And uh, Hans Peter, uh, these guys, you know, they're ophthalmologists, but they became uh, rescue heroes this day. So here we are. Here's my kids and I. We left. Jess went on a shopping spree with the ladies to market. And I did, so these were the only kids with us. But there's 13 of us total. So we had a good adult to kid ratio, 10 to 3. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, it's a little trickle of a waterfall. But at the base, there's this beautiful pool of water. And in the middle of the stream flowing out, there's this giant flat rock that we had this great picnic on. And so as we're um, wrapping up the picnic, this storm rolled in out of nowhere. And I am talking a tropical storm came over the top of the mountain. And the lightning just was intense. And it was just pouring rain, like African rain, you guys who know what I'm talking about. And um, we're down in that ravine. And uh, it's like, this is not a great place to be with this kind of water coming down. Um, but the lightning was so intense, there was an all exposed mountain to get out of the hole, to get out of there. So that wasn't a great idea either. So anyways, we were like huddled under the cliffs, but we're getting drenched in. We're up in the mountains, so it's not warm exactly. We're freezing. And uh, we didn't come very well prepared because mom wasn't with us. Um, so we're all freezing our buns off in this tropical rainstorm. And um, finally, the lightning lets up. And uh, we had a girl with us from Arizona who knew about flash floods and gorges. And she's like, we, we need to get out of here. And I'm like, I agree. So we started getting people out. Um, and uh, I was packing up the picnic stuff on the rock in the middle of the river at the base of the falls. And uh, everyone had gotten out except my daughter was still getting on her last shoe. And there was a young woman there. She had just married one of our Burundian doctors. She's a th the granddaughter of missionaries who had been there forever in Burundi. So she's like, she's lucky if she hits 100 pounds. Tiny, tiny woman. So she's like bent over my daughter trying to help her get her shoe on. And I'm putting the last thing in two big grocery bags that I got on my arms. And, uh, and that's when I heard it. There's, I just heard like a freight train on top of the mountain. And I was like, that is not good. And I looked up over my shoulder, and a giant white wall of water came over the top of the mountain. So it was a flash flood off the top of a waterfall. Uh, which we were at the bottom of. And um, it's the only time in my life I knew I wasn't going to survive. Uh, 
I mean, I was sure I was dead, along with my daughter. And so I looked over, and it felt like an eternity. I looked over at the girl who's over the top of my daughter. And I'm like, there's no way she's going to help my daughter. And um, so she looked at me, and she's like, what are we doing? It's like, there's nothing to do. So I just grabbed my daughter and hugged her in my arms. And uh, I just jumped off this rock into the river and started running as fast as I could. But the rocks are all slippery, you know, like a, a stream. And I'm just like falling down. And, and before we knew it, you know, the flood hit us. And uh, all I can remember was I had gone whitewater rafting as a kid in West Virginia. And I remember when you get knocked out, you get your feet downstream, right? So I was like, get my head out of the, out of the lead and keep my feet going downstream. And uh, so we just got whipped down the stream and we're getting smashed off of rocks and stuff. And, uh, and every time I just tried to bounce a little closer to the edge. And uh, about, I don't know, 100 yards downstream, we got to where we could grab vegetation. I just threw my daughter up. And the roar of the waterfall at this point was deafening. Just the power of the water and the mist whipping. Have it, like when you've gone to Niagara Falls, that, the mist off this thing was incredible and the wind. And uh, I just yelled at her, climb, climb, climb. And she, it, you know, it's a steep gorge. And she just zipped up the hill <laughs> like a bunny rabbit. And I'm like trying to drag myself out of the flood. And, uh, and I'm yelling at her, stop, stop, because she's going to the top of the mountain. Went right by the path up the gorge. And um, she finally turned around because she couldn't hear me yelling because of the, the water, the roar of the falls. And, um, and I, she saw me yelling at her and waving at her because I didn't know where my boys were. I didn't know if they had gotten out or not. And um, so I finally got up to the path, and she came down. And Someone came from a, a, up above around the bend and told me my boys were okay. And then I just like, the adrenaline was so intense. I literally just like fainted on the ground and uh, then felt my leg throbbing intensely. But then someone yelled up from the gorge, Katie stuck in the river. And I, thinking about my kids, I had totally, honestly, I wasn't even thinking about the other person there because I was trying to save my kids. Um, and so I was like, just imagining her drowning in the river, trapped in a branch or something. And so as I got back up, my head was spinning and went back down. And Katie stuck in the middle of the river. Somehow she had grabbed a boulder. I don't know how. She has no upper body strength. <laughs> and gotten up on top of this rock. And the water now is like right to the top of the rock. It wasn't that. The river is no... D, you know, the distance is from me to that pillar right there, and she is in the middle. You know, it's not a huge river, but the, the rage of this water, is, there's no way anyone's going to make it out there and back. And so her husband, this Burundian, doesn't know how to swim, right? And he's a newlywed. <laughs> he had just married her. And so he's grabbing the Austrian ophthalmologist. And he's trying to throw him into the river. He's like literally pushing him into the river. He's like, you know how to swim, save her, save her. And he's like, dude, like you can't swim in that. It doesn't matter. So like I get there and he's like, trying to, he's trying to throw the, the Austrian into the river to save his wife because he can't swim. And I'm like, whoa, like stop. Like this isn't going to go anywhere well. And so then he runs off and he starts hewing down a tree with a rock. Um, and uh, we're like, we need to stop and think uh, like, so we don't get multiple people killed. And um, man, we could not figure out a way to get her off of the rock. There's, um, you know, we had, we had no rope. We had, we had nothing. And there's no way you could get to her. Uh, there's one little scrawny tree growing out of the cliff. We could maybe climb out and bend down to her, but that was super risky. And uh, the rain had let up, and I'm like, I think we got to wait, guys. Like, <laughs> I think doing nothing is the right thing here. And, and um, at this point, my boys had thought Elise and I had died because they saw the flood come down there, just watch this torrent of water land on us and get washed down the river. So my kids were a mess. They thought Caitlin was going to die. Uh, so I went up and calmed them down and prayed with them. Uh, for a, a few minutes. And when I came back, I could tell the water had come down a little bit. But if you're standing there looking at it, you know, you can't see that. I'm like, we got to wait. So about 30 minutes later, um, we were able to get the Austrian ophthalmologist to go further upstream. 
with a big vine out of a, a tree hanging out over the, the river and come down to her and then get her out. Um, I forgot a crucial part of the story. So I told you I had those big picnic bags on my arms. So when I grabbed my daughter and jumped into the river, those immediately filled up with water. And they were, you know, 50 pounds each. And I was like, well, we're certainly going to die if I keep holding on to these things. <laughs> Importantly, our land cruiser keys were in there. And I knew they were in there. So I had a very terrible decision I had to make. I was like, have a chance at swimming or uh, let go of the keys. Uh, and it took us six hours to get to this place. And it was, it was late. It was, you know, we needed to be leaving. <laughs> and uh, so I had to let the keys go down the river. And so after we finally got Katie off the rock, then we're like, yeah, we're all hypothermic. She was shaking like a leaf because she was in this raging mist with the wind on her and you know, mountain rain. So she's like shaking like crazy and we're all pretty cold too. And um, you're like, we have no way to go home. <laughs> so anyways, I had noticed a bend in the river kind of hiking in uh, and I, I talked to our Austrian ophthalmologist and our Canadian ophthalmologist. And they weren't married at the time, so they agreed to go on an expedition. And, uh, and so we sent them out to see if they could find the picnic bags. <laughs> well, we all huddled together. And uh, after about 30 minutes, they came back, and guess what? They had found one of them. And it was full of all sorts of stuff. And the only thing left in it, it had snagged in a tree branch, you know, as the flood went down the valley. <laughs> the only thing left was my wallet and the keys to the Land Cruiser. So, um, so mission accomplished. Uh, so they came back, but we still had to cross the river further down, um, downstream. Here, I'll show you a couple pictures. So this is the waterfall before we, um, the flash flood came. And then our pediatrician, was actually, didn't realize we were still down in the ravine when the flash flood hit. So she turned around and took a picture of this amazing flash flood. And so it went from that to that instantaneously. Um, and that's what hit us there. So anyways, um, yeah, she had no idea what was going down, <laughs> going on down in the valley. So anyways, uh, we then used our, our two ophthalmologists to be, be a human chain across the river further down in a sh the shallowest part we could find to uh, hand our children and smaller ladies across the river. And as my daughter and I's uh, legs and body, just because we needed a story, but, <laughs> but yeah, how, what God would think like they expected. And it's flexible. Um, as we wrap up, as physicians is do no harm. And we can do a lot of harm. Need to ask God for wisdom and knowing when to intervene for someone and when intervening is actually not helping. Um, we could go on a lot about this. I had an example of this. Um, right before I left Burundi, um, I lost my partner uh, who had to come back to the States. I had another ophthalmologist working with me. And so, he was supposed to be there, and I was supposed to have the last week off protected to kind of wrap things up and get my family back to America. But um, I didn't have that. And there was this lady I had seen a couple weeks before who'd come in with this massive tumor. And um, I told her, you have to have a CT scan. I'm not going to go after that orbital tumor without some imaging. She actually got a CT scan. There's only two in the country. Um, she went there, got it, and brought it back, and her orbital roof looked not good. And I was like, you know what? I'd probably have a real good chance of killing you if I do this. There's one neurosurgeon in the capital city uh, at the military hospital. I said, I want you to go see the neurosurgeon, because if we take this out, you're probably going to leak CSF. Um, so she went down there, saw him. He refused to do the surgery. Um, and so, you know, this whole thing took at least a month to play out. And so as I'm getting ready to leave, she shows back up on my doorstep and he had a note from the general surgeon telling me to do the surgery, <laughs> that he wasn't going to do it um, because this needed, it, was, uh, it would be fine. He said it won't leak. <laughs> so I'm like, really, God? Like I, like I wasn't supposed to be working. And I'm like, if I let this lady, if I leave her alone, she's probably not going to be here when I get back. She'll, it'll kill her. And I was like, 
but I'll probably have a real good chance of making a mess out of this one. Um, and so I just, I just told her, I said, there's a real good chance you're going to die in the OR if I try to do this. And it was the last thing I wanted to be doing, to be honest, at that time. Um, and it, and uh, I ended up doing her case. Um, so we did a orbital exoneration, took her down to her, you know, took down her periosteum and took out her orbit and block. Um, before we did that, we harvested a temporalis flap and tunneled it sub Q through her zygomatic arch to have ready to plug up the hole if she sprung a major leak. Um, amazingly, she didn't, she didn't leak. She had paper thin <laughs> orbital roof, but um, the graft is nice anyway. It fills up the defect. So, uh, she ended up doing great and walking out of there, um, and uh, thank God for that. But you know, on a lot of these trips, we're going into places where there's not going to be any follow-up. Um, you're going to be tempted to do things that could really make a mess for people that could ruin the reputation of eye care um, if you're doing cases that are going to have bad outcomes. Uh, so there's so many things to think about. We won't get into it all, but um, I think when you're starting out, really try to focus on those pen light, hand motion, cataracts that have nice reactive pupils, and you're gonna give a great name to eye care, which is really, really important when you're going into an area that doesn't have care. But anyways, a lot more to talk about there. Another thing when someone hosts, uh, hosts visitors, you can have a lot of different mindsets. You can be, have a mindset where you have a lot of expectations of your hosts, and want them to meet all of those expectations. Um, you know, was it Kennedy who said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Is that Kennedy? All right, and he, I'm staying in the hotel he slept in, apparently, before he was assassinated, Texas Hotel. And, uh, but anyways, I think that's the right mindset. When you're on these trips, especially if you're being hosted by, by someone, is thinking how you can serve the people you're, you're visiting. Um, and not having so, so many demands. Like when you come to visit us, like we have limited water, we have limited power, we have limited internet. If you're on YouTube sucking up all the bandwidth, that means no one else can use the internet. You know, you, you got to think about how can I not be a consumer? And if you have certain needs, how can I bring those with me? You know, if you like power bars, you know, pack them in your suitcase and uh, <laughs> uh, things like that. So anyways, that we could talk about lots of other ways to do that. Uh, don't be a discourager. This goes back to kind of don't judge. Uh, you can have visitors that will come in and give you a list of a hundred things that are wrong <laughs> with, your, with your situation and how you need to change things and how terrible everything is. Um, come in with the mindset that I'm going to be an encourager. I'm going to find the things that are working well and really encourage both the, be it the missionary or the nationals because um, you have no idea what their obstacles are. Um, and uh, I think you just want to go in with that mindset of being encouragement, because you can have visitors that are such an encouragement to you, um, and that's an important thing you can do um, on, a, on a trip. And lastly, remember God is good, because I guarantee you, you're going to have questions about that, and I, I do all the time. For me, a retinoblastoma, um, I see a kid a week with retinoblastoma. In Burundi, there's no chemotherapy for anything. There's, if you can't cut out a tumor of any kind, you die in Burundi. So I've never had a kid live with retinoblastoma. So once a week, uh, I have to tell a family, you know, your kid's going to die. And I used to try to and nucleate, even exonerate to try to get it all out. Um, and uh, eventually, they, they'd all pass. Um, so I've had probably 150 kids I've told this to, and that gets old. Um, and uh, so, uh, what happened to my slides there? I wanted to share with you kind of a passage God put on my heart. A couple of my slides went blank. We'll, get, we'll come back to it. But, um, so as I came back to the States, feeling pretty down. Some of you were at COS. I was kind of down at COS. Um, 
uh, as I spent, a, we spent a week debriefing. And God just put Isaiah 58 on my heart. Um, if you guys haven't read Isaiah 58, I think it's the most beautiful passage in Scripture. But God talks about um, what a godly fast looks like, and uh, you know, it's, and He tells um, Israel what that looks like. And the image that sticks in my mind um, is He said, "Pour yourselves out for the poor, the oppressed." Um, and in French, that verb is enverser. It literally means turn upside down. Um, and we would do that, and there's nothing left in the pot. It's painful. Um, but that's what God calls us to do, to, to give ourselves away. Um, and when you get there, you're going to be broken. You're going to wonder, what the hell is God doing? Why does he let this stuff happen? Um, but then he promises us, in that scorched land, he'll be there. The light will break through like the noon. Um, and he will be our fountain of life. But you can't get there until you pour yourself out. So God's going to ask all of us here to do really, really hard stuff. Um, you know, giving up your kingdoms feels like dying. And that's interesting. God said, I want you to die to yourself. Um, so God's going to ask you to do really hard stuff. Uh, and you're going to get to the end and you're going to be maybe in despair. And God will meet you in that place. Um, so that's my challenge to you, is to pour yourselves out. It'll take you to the brink, and God promises he'll be there. And he's going to take you to hard places. These folks here, they're doing that. They're running into dark places. I'm sure they're dealing with you know, the poverty in America, which in some ways is even harder. I mean, addiction and, and all the brokenness that goes with inner city poverty in America, that is heavy stuff. Um, so there's going to be different ways God calls you into those scorched places. Uh, but he's going to meet you there. And he, he is going to be our, our fountain of life. Uh, and he says he's, we're going to be like a tree planted by a river that flourishes. Um, and it'll be a miracle, and people will see that's a miracle. Uh, and God will be glorified through that. So in the end, this, all of this doesn't come down to, to us. You know, a lot of emphasis on short-term trips is, especially for our kids. Oh, this is going to be great for your kids. They'll get a world experience and all the benefits it is to the people participating. It's not about us. It's about God's glory. Um, so anyways, you can pray for us. God's put these kids on my heart. I know it's not it's cost effective as M6, but we've actually launched a retinoblastoma program in Burundi. Um, and uh, we've started doing chemotherapy. We've imported it from around the world and uh, are, are trying to help these kids. And um, so God, God gives us strength when we don't think there's any left. I'm not sure why these slides are gone black, but in the end, God blesses us with the reminders that he is good. And in this video, it'll be a little repetitive because I'm about to say it, but for me, like when I really question God's goodness, you know, God brings a kid to me, maybe with congenital glaucoma, and the surgery goes terrible, and they go blind, and I'm like, God, you brought me to the middle of nowhere. You bring a kid here with a problem I can potentially treat, in it, and, and then you let him go blind anyway. What is going on? Um, something that really helps me, and I'll, and I'll share this in this closing video, is that our God is totally different. He, didn't, he doesn't look at this suffering. He doesn't let it just happen. But our God became flesh and blood and entered into all of the stuff that makes us question this. Um, Jesus entered into our suffering. God himself has entered into the suffering. And I don't understand why he lets evil happen. But I know he entered into it and suffered its, its full blow himself. Um, and that's, that's pretty unique. And that is really um, a comfort to me. And then as an M6 surgeon, obviously, there's a lot of great stuff I get to see. So we're going to close with a great story. This is the story of Fides. Uh, and she'll tell her own story, and then we'll wrap up. One of my passions coming to Burundi was to bring eye care where there is no eye care. When I visited in 2010, there was one ophthalmologist who could do eye surgery for over 10 million people. In Africa, life expectancy 
is about five years if you go blind. Uh, it's a death sentence because life is, life is tough when you're blind in Africa, especially Burundi, it's all mountains. And 75 to 80 percent of blindness is totally reversible or preventable. We want to transform the healthcare system here to a place where patients are going to know they're going to be respected, they're not going to have to, to pay a bribe to get taken care of, and they're going to get great care uh, in the name of Christ. Though I was still young, I realized I was not able to see so well anymore. The doctor found out that I had cataracts, but said they could not help me. They said there is no one in my country to treat me. My husband and I found out at that time that I was pregnant. As my pregnancy progressed, my vision got worse and worse. We kept my blindness secret because people like to talk and would wonder why, why my husband would stay with me since I was blind. People with disabilities are persecuted here, so I stayed at home and did not even tell my family that I was blind. The worst day for me was when my daughter was born. I was completely blind at that time. I could not see her face. So I touched her and felt her to get a sense of how she looks. People told me that she was very beautiful. But I was devastated that I could not see my new baby. As she grew, I tried to make faces at her to make her laugh. But I could not even see if she was smiling. I wanted so badly to look into my baby's eyes. My neighbor heard about my blindness. He came to my husband and told us that he had been treated for cataracts by doctors from Serge at Kubuyi Hospital. He said, you should take your wife there. Fides uh, came to us, totally blind from from cataracts in both eyes. We scheduled her for surgery the same week, and we did one eye. After the surgery, the doctor took off the bandage. He asked me to open my eyes, but I refused. I was afraid that the surgery had not worked. He again said, open your eyes. Then I opened my eyes, and I was able to see everything. I could see my child, I could see her hair, I could see her clothes, and I was jumping with joy. I could see perfectly. When I see folks you haven't seen for years, see again the next day, that keeps me going. Because there's a lot of tough stuff here. We can't help everybody, but when we get to help those people and know that their lives have been transformed through a 10, 15 minute surgery, that's really cool. I tell people all the time I have the best job in the world. I mean, it can't get any better. <laughs> you know, I get to help blind people see again every day. The way Dr. John took care of me makes me think of Jesus and how he healed the blind man and gave him sight. Dr. John shows love to the poor, the rich, the unclean. He models the ministry of Jesus. We're blessed to, to have the mentorship we have at Surge, an organization that's gonna just keep the gospel fresh in our lives, make it practical, and keep preaching the gospel to us, you know, to keep us fresh and, and walking with the Lord. It is a special opportunity to to be the hands and feet of Jesus here in Burundi, trying to share God's love and, and let them know that God loves them and we care about them. You know, our God is different. He, he chose to suffer with us. That does keep me going, because if I didn't know that, I, I don't know if I could keep going. Uh, so I have to keep reminding myself.
our God chose to become flesh and suffer with us. Um, and I think I sometimes it's harder for me to see other people suffer. Uh, so I think that's one of the key, key things that keeps me going. So as you start your M6 journey, God's going to have all sorts of beautiful stories he's going to weave into your life. Um, so those are just a few of the things I would recommend you keep in mind as you go out into the world um, for God's glory. Thanks for inviting me.